it seems like many people have met Eileen through one way or another. It's surprising that every talk we had, she knows a good portion of the people in the audience. But I think you're in for a real treat tonight. It's uh, really a rare opportunity to hear firsthand account of one of the darkest times in uh, modern history. And I think you'll find her talk both tragic, but also her life story and the people who are involved in it. It really is inspirational. I'm sure you'll enjoy it. So first we're going to have a lecture, then we're going to have some slides, and then there'll be time for uh, questions and answers. And if at the end, if you still have any interview left, the museum is open and you can tour that. So with that, just uh, join me in welcoming uh, Irene Kerbal. Thank you very much. To start with, I'm very honored to see that people who already heard my story came back. Uh, that is really something. I was born in the Netherlands in 1933. I always say, don't start calculating my age, that's not right. <laughs> I have a very nice sheltered life with my parents and my sister. And uh, like all the children in the Netherlands, we were ice skating on the frozen canals, riding our bikes in the summer, having lots of friends, playing in the streets and all that. Until May 10, 1940, when the Germans invaded the Netherlands. When I see today what's happening in Ukraine, it brings back the same sensation of panic and fear that we had when my parents made us come up. Children, we have to leave the house, we have to leave the, the town because they're going to bombard us. We had exactly the same situation as Ukraine. Thousands of people on the roads, parents trying to, to shield their children with their own bodies, and actually not knowing where to go. On May 14, the Netherlands surrendered. Hitler installed Arthur Seiss Inquart to become governor of the Netherlands. He was a hardline Nazi extremist. Later, he was judged and sentenced to death in Nuremberg. He immediately imposes the enforced conformity, the systematic elimination of all our cultural and public values in order to make the Dutch country part of the fascist Dutch Reich. All Netherlands political parties were outlawed. Dutch associations and clubs like Rotary or Freemasons were immediately forbidden. Within hours, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, and freedom of press were suspended forever, followed by broadcasting. We only were allowed to hear the propaganda from Nazi distribution radio, and we had to bring our own shortwave radios to the Gestapo, because they didn't want us to be able to listen to anyone so very soon there came a curfew. Nobody could be in the street after eight o'clock until six o'clock next morning. All our correspondence was opened and inspected. It did not happen all at once, but very slowly in such a way that people thought, oh no, it will go back to normal, which never happened. We had to darken all our windows with black paper or any other means so no light could be seen from the air, from any house, because every night hundreds of Royal Air Force bombers flew over our country to bombard Germany. But since we were invaded by the Nazis, we also were considered enemy territory. 
The sirens warned us when the air raids are starting and bombing were about to happen. People refused in basement and in public shelters. We literally were living in darkness and fear. In March 41, the Nazis issued ID cards for the population. The Jews had their stamp with the big J and were obliged to use the yellow uh, David star with Jew written on it. <clears throat> Jews had no right to have their own business or to use telephones. All public transportation was void to them. They were exposed from all the public employments and they only could shop between three and five o'clock in the afternoon. They also were forbidden to enter homes of non-Jews. Jewish children were banished from public schools. All of a sudden, we had our friends say, well, we, we will not come back. We are going to stay with my aunt, or we're going to travel. They were going in hiding, but of course, they could not help us. My father was outraged with the Nazis' behavior and started finding Jewish people from the get-go, in spite of the Nazis' warning that whomever helped the Jew would be treated like one. I remember the name of at least 10 people who came to our house, although not all at the same time. So my father brought some in, brought others to other addresses, just in order to keep them safe. We children did not even know their real names. They had false papers, but for us, they were just uncles and aunts. It was a challenge to hide so many people in your house because there are always people looking, watching, and willing to tell the Nazis. We at, we at the young age, we became very much involved because my parents told us every single day, don't talk about this with anybody, not with your best friends and nobody. Don't talk. And they repeated that every day to make sure that we would, that we would not forget. Not even with your best friends. And when you're a kid, you want to talk with your best friends and tell them what is happening. Our life was as a description of Anne Frank's life when they were in hiding. We froze with fear every time we heard a truck stopping in the street. Massive deportation from Jews of the Netherlands to Germany happened on a daily basis. The Germans had in store what they called the Jewish Council. Prominent businessmen, bankers, and they told them, look, we are going to find work for all your people, give us their names, their skills, their profession, and you might be sure that we, we will find good work for them. That made an enormous database for the, for the Germans. The Nazis frequently raided all the homes in our neighborhood in search of Jews. Usually early in the morning, they shut up the street at both sides with barbed wire. And they came into the houses, dragging people in the streets, separating families. We saw a lot of screaming and crying. We did not know at that time what was happening. We thought that was really that they are going to go to labor camps and that the children would be better off. Several times they searched our house also. But people always could reach the secret hiding place in time. My father had played we had a, an enormous wooden box in the attic where we had the coal to warm the house. And he had made a false bottom and there was a little door. And as soon 
as we saw soldiers or whatever, we had a little bell at the door mm -hmm. and ring it so they could go in hiding. One of my scariest moments was a morning I woke up, my father was standing next to my bed and what seemed to me a giant German soldier, armed from head to toe, and he had hand grenades in his boots. And just a few days earlier, they had made a demonstration of the damage that hand grenades could do. My grandfather, father, and uncles were all in the resistance. We called it the underground. When injustice becomes war, Resi resistance becomes duty. Since the Gestapo confiscated our radios, the resistance started hiding radios in attics or in, in basements wherever they could in order to have news from Radio London and to know what was really happening in the war. Because the Nazi propaganda did not tell us because they were doing everything, uh, they were winning everywhere. So my grandfather had one of those radios and he took notes and made little, scribbled little things for his friends who had no radio. And he said he didn't want to go in the street because every able-bodied man could be taken away by the Nazis to go to labor camps. Not concentration, but labor camps. They had to work for the, for the war. Um, yeah. So my grandfather told us, said, okay, Dad, you are gonna help me. You have to go, I have here a little roll of information. You have to go to that and that address. Repeat, that and that address, yes. You have to ask for Mr. Janssen. You remember? Yes, Mr. Janssen. So now you take that little roll and put it in the handlebar of your little scooter and you guys pretend that you are going to play in the street. When you come to the, to the address, I get you. Ring the bell, ask for Mr. Janssen. If Mr. Janssen is not there, don't give it to anybody, not to his wife, not to his children, not to his brother, absolutely nobody. And if they ask you, why do you want so much with Mr. Janssen? Just tell me my grandfather what to talk to him. We needed food stamps or coupons for everything and everybody. Rationing was an order way to control the population. Since the people hidden in our house were non-existent, they had no food coupons. So my father started working at the food stamp distribution center. And he, a local resistant, started falsifying coupons and food stamps. It was difficult to get the necessary food for everybody in the household without being suspect. There were always people on the route to tell the Nazis about any unusual movement. We could not even trust our neighbors or friends anymore. On June 6, 1944, six days after my 11th birthday, the Gestapo came back to our house. This time, it were not even German soldiers but Dutch traitors, civilians, Dutch people who worked for the Gestapo. I was almost ready to go to school, open the door, and it was in, the, the door to the street was down a flight of stairs, and I saw three people coming in. Since they were not soldiers, I didn't ring the bell to warn the people upstairs to go in hiding. And I asked them, what do you want? What can we do for you? They said, IRS. Then my mother came 
And she said, what is happening here? And I said, I said, IRS, she said, show me your, your document, show me why they pushed my mother aside, she fell on the floor, and they immediately went upstairs. At that time, we only had two Jews sample men at the house, because there had been, been so many raids around, my father brought a lot of them to other addresses. Everybody was taken to the living room. They asked my mother, where's your husband? My mom said, well, my husband is working. I can call him. He's working at the distribution center for food truck stamps. I said, no, here's just the phone number. And then they asked, who is your doctor? My doctor is Dr. Dubois, my mother said. At that time, we had two little brothers who were born during the war. One of the guys called my father's office and said, this is Dr. Dubois. Mm -hmm. Mr. Perval has to go home immediately because the oldest of the two babies is dying. When I hear that, I thought, I am going to tell them I have to go to school and I will go to the streetcar stop and tell my father not to come home. So I said, sir, I, I have to leave. Not I will be late, late for school, but nobody leaves the house. Later, when my father came in, he looked at my mother, who had my little brother on her lap, and smacked him in his face and said, don't give signs to your wife. We will tell you why you are here. And I started insulting him and accusing him in the most horrible, most horrible way. So, a little later, they took my father and the two Jewish people all the way to the Gestapo headquarters in our own street. We didn't know what was going to happen. We had no idea. Next day, they came back with moving trucks and emptied our house completely. Everything was confiscated. So we were, my mother was there with four children. It was kind of a miracle that my mother and we were not taken away because that was only because we were not Jews. Because Jewish families were all taken away. We were completely lost. With the help of the resistance, we found a tiny little apartment and borrowed a table and chairs and mattresses from friends and family. With our food stamps, we only could buy uh, one scoop of a kind of a mixture made with uh, potato peels, cabbage trunks, and residues from sugar bits that had no, that had no uh, nutritious value whatsoever. Meat and eggs were only available at the black market for exorbitant prices. There was no soap, only bars of a kind of clay. Lots of people got sick, skin diseases, diseases, lice, because of the lack of hygiene and the lack of water. We only had water during an hour a day, like electricity. We, we really had to, to try to survive with that. Not only food and medicine, but everything else was scarce. No clothes, no fabric, no shoes or leather for new soles. I remember that the upper part of our shoes being cut off and nailed to, to wooden soles. So we still could use them for a, a certain time. When they became too short, the, the front part was just cut away and our toes could, could go through. On September 5th, 1944, D-Day happened, the invasion in Normandy. And we expected to be liberated at any moment 
because of the rapid extent of the Allied troops. France, Belgium, and the south of the Netherlands were already liberated. We start dancing in the streets, thinking it will happen. <coughs> It didn't. Uh, we in Amsterdam were still in the suffocating grip of the Nazis and became meaner and meaner every day. The food became even more scarce and rare since all the, the shops were empty and everything that was left was confiscated by the German army. We did not imagine that the, that the Wars was still to come. The winter of 1944 and 1945 was called the Hunger Winter. It was the coldest on record. We were starving, had no means to warm our houses, and even the food stamps were useless because the shops were empty. We only had the only scoop of cabbage stuff that today we would not even feed to pigs. The only quality it had, it was warm. But when you reached home, it was already cold. The whole civilian population was undernourished. And we saw more than often people dropping dead in the streets from starvation. During that hunger winter, in Amsterdam alone, 2,500 people died in the streets a lack of medicine and the coal, and about 30,000 soldiers around Amsterdam and open cities. We survived with what we call wonder stoves. Little stoves made out of coffee cans with a little chimney inside, in which you could pour a boil a pot using paper, cardboard, or small twigs, or chopped up furniture, whatever we had available to after the boil, we put the pots in a, in a box with hay, covered it with a blanket, and the farm finished the cooking, and it keeps the food more or less warm until dinner time. That's why I became an enthusiastic solar cooking uh, teacher, because I said, I know, I know how you can do that. I, I have seen that before. <laughs> On May 5th, 1945, the Canadians entered Amsterdam, followed by the Americans. And Germany finally surrendered. We were free. Everybody was in the streets, dancing, singing, greeting our liberators. We all wanted to be, on the, to be on the tanks with the soldiers. They had cigarettes, they had chocolate, they had everything we had been dreaming about. And of course, everybody wanted to go to the royal palace, which was the icon of our own nationality. But very soon the resistance warned, don't go to the royal palace. There are still Nazis and French there, and they shoot everybody that comes near. So there were a lot of people who still lost their lives. The Dutch brought out all their uniforms, <coughs> military police, police, boys and girls groups, everything that had been forbidden for five years. There were Dutch flags everywhere, and we all wanted to wear orange, which is the color of our royal house. My mother had a very beautiful orange silk dress that we happily shred and tore apart to make scarf for all of us. <laughs> Food was still absent. But a few days later, the British Royal Air Force and uh, in, uh, with His Royal Highness Prince Bernard of the Netherlands, they started the Operation Mana. Food coming from heaven. <laughs> we saw the planes swooping over Amsterdam and at our airport, they dropped packages with food. There were at least 2,800 Lancaster who dropped 6,600 tons of food. 
we all went to the uh, to the roof. Thank you, thank you. And in the beginning, we only had some fields with crackers and lard. This mm, delicious. Mm. We started putting lard on the top, <laughs> eating it. We were sick as a dog. We could, or our organism could not handle that kind of food. It was way too rich. Um, an interesting story that happened to me is when I was did this talk in Jackson, one of my friends brought her father-in-law from England. And when he heard the story, he said, I participated of the Operation Mama. Well, I was the one who probably brought the food. I was the real brother and opened it. I was so, I, I went to him and said, I cannot believe it that after 75 years, I can say, thank you, sir. It was emotional for me, but for him also. And then I told, um, a few days later, I told my friend, look, I'm going to visit him, and I will bring him some chocolate in memory of the Cadbury chocolate that I brought for us. <laughs> the day I had to go, she called me in the morning, and she said, Ron died in his sleep oh. last night. I was very sad, and one of my friends said, look what a beautiful completion of his life, that somebody he saved from her could say, thank you, sir. Yeah. Very soon, at the soccer stadium, close to our house, started arriving the buses that brought the political prisoners from the concentration camps in Germany. It was heartbreaking to see those living skeletons still in their ragged blue and gray uniform. Many of them could not even walk, had to be carried. We went every day with a picture of my father, asking, does anybody know him? Does anybody know where he is? Have you seen him? Nobody could ever help. And we returned home in tears. My mother said, no, there will be more buses tomorrow, and then I fight it. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. We only, uh, my two uncles came back from the concentration camp, uh, being deported also. They had seen my father in Oranienburg, and they wanted to stay together. But of course, they had no say about that. And my father was put on the transport to Neuengamme's son hostel to Gulag Bay X. Later, he heard that my father had died there on May 13, 1945, just a week after the war was over and the camp was liberated. There were no survivors of that camp because when the Allied troops are coming, they inoculate the tigers to all the surviving prisoners. There are no words to describe the atrocities committed in concentration camp. No films or books go even near to reproduce the atmosphere of suffering that still impregnates the wall of the barracks. As soon as the prisoners arrive, the cattle ladies at the, at the cattle Raiders just at the camps. They were separated. Men and women alike had their heads shaved, taking all their clothes away, all their personal belongings, just in order to make them mere numbers. And those numbers were etched in blue ink in their flesh. The Nazis wanted the prisoners to feel they were no longer individuals. Families, homes, and history were not uh, in interesting anymore. They were just the numbers. I never had the courage to visit one of those dead camps. 
I only saw a transition camp in Belgium, and I visited the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. and the Anfrag Hiding House in Amsterdam. At all those venues, the whole energy was so subdued that people only whispered. Hitler used the myth of Aryan superiority, white supremacy, and the Nazis became the most cruel murderers in history. Their one safe plan resulted in a mechanic, massive, almost industrial destruction of the Jewish population in the concentration camps. At one time, during their one say gatherings, uh, they said, well, we can we can just uh, kill that many Jews in a day. And then one of them said, what are you going to do with all the corpses? We made the prisoners build cremation systems, <coughs> and the corpses will be buried in those homes. And when they are done with their job, we will put them in ovens also. The horror of national socialism and Nazism was not only a Jewish tragedy, was a crime against all humanity. Besides the six million murdered Jews, adults and children, the concentration camp, journalists, intellectuals, handicapped people and disabled people, homosexuals and Slavic citizens and Romans are among them. 12 million victims. Also the Germans who dared to oppose Hitler and his ideas like Pastor Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who preached against the Nazis, and the 21-year-old German student Sophie Scholl, were also arrested and cruelly murdered. My father had no intention of being a hero. In his calm way, he always took the right decision for the circumstances. But he left us a legacy of great courage, humanity, and abnegation, and told us never to be afraid and always stand up for our principles. After the liberation, I remember my mother saying, children, this is a historical moment. The world peace, we never will have war again. It is very sad to know but since then, actually, we never stopped. And we had the same cruel situation in Ukraine now. What was the lesson I learned from this experience? First of all, never, never, ever give up. This was confirmed by Mitka Kalinsky, a Holocaust survivor I met at the Rotary Club of Spark. He had the same age when the war started. Of course, his life was way more dramatic than mine because he went through several concentration camps. But he also said, never, never, ever give up. And always keep fighting fascism and similar hateful ideologies. Another survival technique he talked about was to keep your sense of humor. Jokes about the Nazis and the Germans and even about yourself made us laugh. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mitka said the same thing. They did the same thing. More surprising even is that Viktor Frankl, himself a Holocaust survivor, highlights the importance of humor in concentration camps. He explains that it was an odor of the soul's weapons in the fight for self-preservation. To be honest, it took me years to understand that we never should compromise with intolerance. Right after the war, we were very angry with the Germans. It was only later that I understood that wars have no winners. They bring sorrow and destruction on both sides. The German civilians mostly 
women and children died from bombardment, from hunger, and suffered as much as we did. At one time, I gave this speech in Pimo, and the organization had invited a German of my age. He was, he was kind of nervous and didn't know how to do with his paperwork, and I said, Eckhart, sit down. Do like this. Do this for the paper. Don't let anybody distract you. Go on with your talk. And I said, okay, thank you. So see, I'm not angry at the Germans anymore. <laughs> <laughs> if in 1945 somebody had told me, you're going to hurt the German, I would say, absolutely not. <laughs> but I hurt him, and he hurt me, and we were emotional, both of us. But until today, I have the zero tolerance. And that is for Nazis, neo-Nazis, and swastika flags in the Straits of America, or any other country. It eludes me how any American would accept to have the name now the word Nazi associated with their own name. Keep in mind that 460,000 Americans, 380,000 British, and 420,000 Canadian brave soldiers gave their lives to liberators from fascism. And they were left behind in the empty streets of white houses, as far as the eye can see. Hatred must be exposed and denounced. It is poison, it divides, it perverts, and it corrodes the container of that is it. And there is no victory that ever can compensate for the loss of such a number of young lives. As a child, my life was completely disrupted. And at a very young age, I became a rebel with the cross. <laughs> but by now, my message, is, my message is, let us make sure to be messengers of peace, to which the only ways are forgiveness and reconciliation. I became a Rotarian whose aim it is to make the world a better place. And we practice peace through service. I'm even a, a proud member of the Rotary Intercounty Committees that was started after World War II between Germans and French, two people who absolutely hated each other. Until the Rotarian stepped in and said, let's go together, let's sit around the table, eat together, become friends. And by now, there are uh, administrative uh, humanitarian projects together. That was really something very, very important. I have a message for young people, and I see there are a lot of young people here, and everybody else is young enough at heart to listen to me. <laughs> no matter how many shadows around us, we are here to manifest our light and peace. A single lighted candle breaks the darkness. If you are influential in friendship, bring all your light to friendship. If you are influential in education, bring all your life to education. If you are good in animal care, bring all your life to animal care. And if you have a kiosk on the beach, make all your sandwiches with love. <laughs> Don't waste energy on <coughs> polarizing, attacking. That just deepens the separateness from our fellow humans. We have an immense power that can transform whatever needed if we are wise and brave enough to promote peace around us, starting in our own environment, no matter how small. Songs are like candles. We can light them each other. And if you light a candle for someone else, it also brightens your path. Thank you. Thank you.
So here you will see things I have been talking about. In July 2018, that's when I started doing those presentations and doing new talks. Since then I did 90. This is the 91st. 90. I was born in 1923 at the Blue with my parents and my little sister. That is my school picture when I was in second grade. And that is the school picture of Anne Frank. We were at the same Montessori school. Not at the same time because she was four years older. And four years when you are a child is a lifetime. <laughs> that was the, the New Yorker when the Nazis invaded Holland, Belgium, and Luxembourg. German troops arriving in the Netherlands. There were German tanks and trucks everywhere. They started bombarding the port of Rotterdam. That's why everybody ran away from the, from the towns and the cities. They were afraid to be bombarded also. All along the North Sea coast, they built what they called the Atlantic Wall heavily armed bunkers in order to defend them against the English on the other side of the North Sea. And I thought that from there they would just go over and, and invade England also. There were Nazi soldiers in all the streets. I still can hear the noise of their boots on the pavement and they were singing. It was not, it was not a country. And here that was the propaganda minister, Goebbels. I don't believe that he said control the media. He didn't have that word at that time. He only he controlled the press and the broadcasting. So within 24 hours, freedom of speech, of assembly, and of the press were suspended. And the Nazis told us that we, if we were good patriots, we should, or young people should join the SS in order to combat the, the Bolsheviks. There were every night, certain night over Amsterdam, when the Royal Air Force planes flew over. And as soon as they, uh, they spotted the plane, they shot it down. So very often, all resistance help the English pilots to go in hiding before they were taken by the Nazis. This is the start that the Jewish people had to eat at Queens. They could not go in the streets or anywhere without that. Here you see uh, people with the star on their clothes. And everywhere we saw those signs forbidden for Jews. This was the scary thing I told you that one, one morning I saw uh, next to my bed those heavily armed soldiers and on the, on the drawing you can see the hand grenades in his boot that was just at my eye height. And here they started dragging people out of the houses all around in the street. Everywhere where I ended up. And a massive deportation started. More than 140,000 Jews lived in Holland. Only 5,200 made it, survived the Holocaust. <coughs> the transport to the camp was in capital wagons. There were so many people in Sweden that they had no place to sit down. There was no water, there was no food. Several of them died before they arrived in the camp. This is the maps of several of the concentration camps. The Germans had something like 380 concentration camps all over. This is a picture of concentration camps. This is Neuengamme Stalag where my father perished. And 
and those are prisoners from the camp. The little German, German boys were groomed to be the very glorious uh, future SS officer. And at the same time, the Jewish boys of that age were dying in concentration camps. Mm. The children, very often, all of them were immediately taken to the guest chambers because they could not work, they could not do anything, and the Germans didn't want to feed them. Here you see the children who go in Buchenwald. And uh, maybe he said, he said, that he never would forget the little faces of the children who thought he turned into waves of snow beneath a silent blue sky. One of those children was Anne Frank, who was in hiding until they were uh, the Gestapo found them, and she died from illness and starvation in a concentration camp, as well as her sister and her mother, the only one of the family who survived was Otto Frank, and that is why they found the diary of Anne and the father uh, helped to, to make it known over the whole world. They made the prisoners stay naked in the bitter cold for hours. Not with, for anything, but just telling them, we have to count you over and over and over, just to break their spirit. And this was the final solution of Hitler for the, for the Jews. Started with the gas chambers and the cremation that was for food stamps, that with, what, with which we could have the only scoop of food in the air. Here you see what they called a water stove. By now, in my kitchen, we called it a rocket stove. Mm -hmm. It sounds a little better. <laughs> and that is the hay basket. Just or a box or something with hay, you put the boiling pot in there, cover it with the blanket, and it cooks, it finished the cooking of your food. Here you see a family trying to keep warm, no shoes, no socks, nothing to burn in there. In, yeah. Here are people waiting for their scoop of soup. Even the children have to go, everybody had to go to get their own portion. That was the, the soup kitchen. And as you can see, the very badly undernourished children. And dropping dead from starvation in the street. This is the official document of the Mama Association when they started throwing food from the heaven for us. Here you see the Royal Air Force flying over Amsterdam. <clears throat> and dropping the food packages at our airport. We all went to the to the to the roofs. Thank you, Alan. We were yeah. This was Mr. Ron Hampson, the Royal Air Force member who participated of the Operation Mana. That was a very special meal. Here you see the Allied officers meeting with the Dutch resistance. The guys with the helmets were, were the resistance because police, everything was dismantled. It was the Germans who took care of everything. But they took over. And finally, you could fly your flag again with a nice orange banner. That's not the one from my mother's dress. No. <laughs> And people wanted to go on the tanks. It was hard to imagine. It was like heaven opening for us. We saw those Americans well dressed in their beautiful uniforms. Was, we could not imagine it anymore. And this is the stencil they used to tell us not to go to the royal palace. They almost had no ink and very bad paper. They had to warn the population. And 
here you see, uh, like the Third Royal Palace, many people have been shot. So we have memorials everywhere for the civilians who lost their life. And this is how those prisoners from concentration camps came back. That was absolutely heartbreaking. And here at the, the Association of Bars and Culture brought back the remains of the prisoners, uh, among them those of my father. And as you can see, there are all these children present. They, they take all the school children and show them. And they have only a headstone with the name when they were born and when they died. And every year at the Memorial Day, somebody of the same age stands behind the headstone so the children have an idea of who, who died. And this is an American cemetery. When we saw that, we cried our hearts out. That was very difficult. I still have a hard time with it now. Uh, and we see all those white crosses as far as the eye could see. And that's only one in the Netherlands. And you have them everywhere. In Belgium, in France, everywhere. Look at those young kids who went to liberators. Many of them lied about their age in order to be accepted in the army. And how many died fighting the Russians? They made the ultimate sacrifice. So you cannot be both a proud American and a Nazi. So that is my, my still my zero tolerance. And I remember when we came to the United States and we wanted a visa, the first thing they asked is, have you, uh, any time, uh, have you been in a Nazi uh, association or whatever? Because if people had been in Nazi group, it was, they didn't get a visa. So in the camp where my father died, became a museum thanks to the Rotary and the Lions Club. That is what, for people not to forget. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Uh, do you have any questions, uh, Rari? How did you get those pictures? Where did you get all those pictures? How did you get them? Where did you get the pictures? Oh, the pictures. Oh, I had them at the, the, war, uh, the, uh, the Warsaw Culture Association. I had them in, in the Netherlands. They have a whole lot of them to teach the children at school what happened. And then some of them, we. They have the, like the coupons for the food and things like that. And then the bed stencil, I still have it in my, in my paperwork. Uh, do you remember the appeasement? Pardon? Do you remember the appeasement? Uh, before the war started, Germany was being like extremely aggressive, taking different places. and. Uh, Britain and France offered an appeasement, giving them part of the country that I can't pronounce the name of, and they thought it would work, but then the Germany went and took more of the country, and then I think... Yeah, yeah, I know, but you know, there are so many things that changes everything, uh, and we have no control over it, not at all, because they took over the Nazis, they, they were the ones who who told us what to do or what not. Right. Yeah. Any questions? I have a comment. 
I've known Irene for quite a while, and I was in Rotary with her, and it was rather interesting how we realized it for her. But I never really understood her passion for solar cookers and rocket stoves until I saw this. <laughs> <laughs> I loved it, but I didn't understand it. <laughs> Yes, I also have a question, and I also have sort of, I mean, I know, I mean, but I would have a question about the people in the Netherlands. When you said everything started to happen really slow and nobody really noticed yeah. the beginning restriction, did anybody notice it? Did people want to leave, and could they leave? Well, we, when we were the such a way, but we don't have, you know what? Very soon that will be over, like the, 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 the curfew and all that. It will come back to normal. Mm -hmm. and, and we encourage each other to be like that. Yeah, yeah. It, it didn't happen. Though. It, it can't be any different than when we have a storm in the south or when we have a wildfire here in our own state. People just don't want to leave home. They want to stay there. They feel safe there. Yeah, no, they're not. Why not some people? <laughs> no, a lot of times. It's, it's <laughs> hard to get people to But to, to that point, though, was the propaganda kind of geared that way as well to make you think it was just temporary? They never talked about it, but they said, we are winning, we are going well, we are, we are fighting the Russians. That was very, they were in quote, said, Look, it's not going to be invaded by the Russians. We are protecting you. Uh, that was their kind of propaganda. Of course, it wasn't true, but that's what they said, yes. Do you see any similarity with the American Nazi Party? The people that are American Nazis to the Nazis in those days? Any similarity between the current American Nazi Party and the Nazis of back then? Well, you know, you see it everywhere, unfortunately. I thought I never would see a swastika in my life. And now you see it in the streets of America. For us, America could do no, no wrong. America was heaven opening so much that I wanted an American boyfriend. I had to wait 70 years to get <laughs> I was only 12 then. Nobody looked at me. <laughs> Uh, when did you come to the United States? And did you come with your, your mother and siblings? And then can you tell us why you decided to? When did you come to the United States? Oh, did you bring your family? That is a very, no, I didn't bring my family. That's a very old story. Okay. After the war, I went to Africa, where I lived for 14 years. After that, we went to Brazil, where I lived for 37 years. It's too long. Okay. <laughs> Way too much. Okay. 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 Right. I have one more question. Yes, sir. Were you in Amsterdam? Yes. You were? Amsterdam. I, I didn't realize no. it. That's all right. Okay. In our part of the city, there were a lot of Jewish people around us. Amsterdam South. There's a town called Leiden. You, you're familiar with that? Leiden? Leiden, I know, that's the university of Leiden. Everything was taken by the, by the Nazis. We could, we could not have our own systems anymore. And the Nazis built part of Leiden, right? Oh, maybe. That I could not tell you. I was a child. I had no idea. <laughs> thank you. OK, well, uh, join me in uh, thanking her again. For Also, uh, please take these brochures with you and use them to keep track to the foundation of our other lectures. Uh, we're planning on having our new back in the near future for a different talk, and that which takes up where this talk leaves off. And uh, we'll have some others also. So please take a minute uh, with you and review it to see how you can keep track of us and help us out. Thanks for coming here.